Hi. Welcome. My name is Bernie Lutchman. Thank you for joining me today on Plumb Line, our Bible teaching show, which we, uh, where we get into the plumb line of truth, the Word of God, and modern application. And, and what a joy it is to be serving the Lord. This is the day that the Lord hath made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. You know, the old song says that every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before, and isn't that the truth? If you're walking with Him. So if you remember our last program, we, uh, we started a three-part series on the Lord's Prayer from the Jewish perspective as given to us by the Jewish rabbi, Jesus, prophet, priest, and king. And we're looking at it um, uh, phrase by phrase, and we're comparing it to the actual pray, prayer that came out of the Amida, which is the Jewish prayer, which is still prayed today in the synagogues. And now we're comparing it to um, what the words that Jesus gave us. <clears throat> what Jesus was doing here in the, with the, the simple words of the Lord's Prayer is not giving us something we should repeat um, every Sunday or five times if we go to confession and we get this as a penance. Well, he's showing us here the example how we should be praying and, and, um, and the beautiful contrast with the actual Amida and, but what Jesus has actually done here also is given us the starting point for some really powerful prayer intercession using your knowledge guided by wisdom by the, by, given to you by the Holy Spirit to pull out of the scriptures to extract that, that, that meat, that, that, that juicy meat that is in the Psalms, in the Gospel, even in the Old Testament, which is rich with prophecy, and then to pray that back to the Lord you, by jumping off the Lord's Prayer, which is the example. It is not the prayer itself that we're supposed to run with. It's the example we're supposed to use phrase by phrase, comparing it with the Amida. Before we do that, I want to tell you a story about Handel's Messiah. Um, you know, George Handel, um, I think his name is George. Yeah. Anyway, Handel. <laughs> Handel's Messiah is really popular around Christmas time and Easter, and um, it, it's an amazing piece of music written by a man of God. And, um, you know, every time we get to the part where the Hallelujah Chorus, we all stand up in church or wherever we are. Uh, you've seen the video, it, it's pretty popular on YouTube. It's uh, millions of hits. It's a flash mob in a mall in somewhere upstate New York. And, and the, the choir is all dressed like reg the, the shoppers, you know, sweaters and sweatpants and stuff. And then on cue with the choir director, they all stand up and they all start a hallelujah chorus from different parts, from the food court, on the back of the food court, in front of the gap or something like that. And they do the hallelujah chorus and people are just loving it. So check that out on YouTube sometime. And, uh, and it, but there's a wonderful story behind the hallelujah chorus, not just why people stand up to it, for it and to it. Uh, in fact, Let's, think, let's talk about the standing up part first. That actually came out of a tradition started by King George II, I think it was. King, yes, King George II. The first time Handel played the Messiah um, in London, King George was asleep. When they hit the Hallelujah Chorus, it was so forceful and powerful. Hallelujah. And, and, the, and the orchestra and the, it just boomed out with the music. Uh, should we say powerfully, that he jumped out of his seat. And whenever the king jumps up and stands up, everybody else does. That started the tradition of standing during the Hallelujah Chorus. And um, about 150-something years later, his, aunt, his descendant, Queen Victoria, who was by that time very old, and you remember she was a, king, a queen for 70 or something, or oh, 80 years or something, she was in a wheelchair, and she went to the uh, public performance of, of Handel's Messiah. When they got to the Hallelujah Chorus, even though she was in a wheelchair, she forced herself to stand up, respecting who the Hallelujah Chorus was about. And the story about um, Handel's Messiah, how that came about, is really neat. Handel was a, um, was a depressed young man. Um, he was about... 29 years old, he was in debt. He was trying to make a career in music. And um, 
wasn't working out too good for him. In fact, he was getting pretty close to being sent to debtor's prison, which is Tower of London back in those days. I mean, and in those days, they, uh, not like now where you can work out a payment with the bank. They sent you to prison if you owed and you couldn't pay. So he was depressed. And um, one, of his, one time, a friend of his, Charles Jennings, came by and tried to inspire him to keep writing music. And uh, he gave him 73 verses from the Bible. 73 verses from the Bible. There were 42 verses from the Old Testament and 31 from the New Testament. And these passages from, um, were, were passages from Psalms, Isaiah, and the 31 from the New Testament. And it would be a good study sometime to get into uh, that, song, that, that work and see how the thread that he really went through there to weave that, that, that the scriptures into that work of art. So, so getting back to Handel's Messiah, he wrote that in 24 days. It, it's an, um, well, you, take my word for it, it's, it's amazing. After the 21 days, 24 days of writing this and studying the 73 verses, he was so powerfully moved. This is what Handel said. Now, remember, when, one thing I forgot to mention was while he was writing this over 21 day, 24 days, he hardly ate. He was fasting and working and writing this and studying those 73 verses and what it meant and what Jesus meant. And he was so moved. This is what Handel said. I did think, I did see all of heaven before me and the great God himself. Right after that, he finished the Hallelujah Chorus. If you think about worship and, handle, and think about how, how this has affected millions of people. Handel wrote this and released it in 1741. 1741 is a great year for Christianity. In July 1741, Jonathan Edwards had the greatest sermon ever recorded in history and which is, has stood his test, uh, the test of time. Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God was preached in, in July 1741 in Connecticut and began the first great awakening. Over in London, Handel's Messiah, the Hallelujah Chorus, where he saw where after 21 days of almost fasting and, and, and praying and, and writing music, he said he saw heaven open up and he saw God himself in tears. Brings us back to the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer. Last time we did the phrases, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed, holy, sanctified is your name. Your kingdom come. Your earthly government come here on earth. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So the next phrase we're going to look at, last time we looked at worship and the restoration of God's kingdom. Now we're going to look at requests. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. Now, the request, we, we know what that means. We need food, clothing, shelter. And these days we need transport to get to work. We need to pay our bills. We need to uh, feed our kids and that kind of thing. So, we need the hand of, of God. We need Jehovah Jireh. We need provision from him. So here's, here's Jesus now. He, and because he goes on, when he's teaching on the Lord's Prayer as the great Jewish rabbi, he goes on in chapter 6, because you have to take the whole thing in context, and he teaches about provision. He, let's, let's see what he's talking about here. In the same chapter, chapter 6, Jesus is talking about people who are worrying about where the next meal is coming from, where, how am I going to pay this bill? Now, it's easy to, for a preacher to preach from this and say, Jesus said this, when you have to meet the bills yourself. But friend, if you don't trust him with everything, if you don't give yourself to him, if you don't um, give him the first fruits of your labor, the things are not going to go well for you. And, or if they do, it'll go well for a short time, and then not all the time. Here's what Jesus said. 
Do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Remember Esau? Esau sold his birthright, he sold his soul for a bowl of stew. And then afterwards, when he realized what he did, and after Jacob had stolen his birthright, he tried to get it back, and it was too late. Look at the birds of the air, says Jesus in verse 6, 26 of chapter 6 of the Sermon on the Mount. Look at the birds of the air, that they do not sow, nor reap, nor gather in barns, like you and I, like our farmers, who feed the world, and yet our Heavenly Father, your Heavenly Father, feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you, by being worried, can end a single hour of your life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. But yet I say to you, not even Solomon, in all his glory, clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire furnace, or is dried up in the fields and sometimes burns up in a forest fire, will he not much clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry when saying, what will we eat, what will we drink, what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. And we see it these days. Um, during the Christmas shopping season, all through the year, people are concerned about how they look. What, um, people can talk about, especially younger folks, they want to buy labels. They want eyes on, they want Gap, they want American Eagle. Um, what's the other one? Um, Abercrombie and Fitch and that kind of stuff. They want, they want, they want designer labels and clothes. They worried more about that than their internal destiny because nobody's telling them any different. Jesus says, the Gentiles, the pagans, uh, basically, seek after these things. For your heavenly Father knows you need all these things. God knows we need clothes. God knows we need a car to get to work. God knows we need a home. I tell you, friend, if you trust Him, give Him your first fruits. As He said, that's not in the Old Testament, that's full counsel of God. Give Him with a joyful heart. Obey Him, trust in Him, pray, He will provide. But seek first the kingdom of God, and He said it here, and His righteousness. Seek righteousness, holiness, sanctification. Seek to grow in the Lord, and all these things will be added to you. So, as we, as we go to the first section here, give us our daily bread. Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So, um, Matthew 6, verse 11 says, Give us our daily bread. That part of the Lord's Prayer is from the Amida. It says here, the Amida, uh, section 7, Look upon our affliction and plead our cause and redeem us speedily for your name's sake. For you are a great Redeemer. Blessed are you, O Lord, the Redeemer of Israel. That is the Edema, sorry, the, the Amida, uh, cross-reference to give us our daily bread, and he goes on. This is for the affliction. For the, we, we, if we're sick, we bring our request, request to him. Give us our daily bread. It could be anything. It could be a bread for healing. It could be a bread for food. It could be a bread for home. The Amida says in section 8, Heal us, O Lord, that we may be healed. Save us that we will be saved. For you are our praise. O grant a perfect healing to all our ailments. For you, Almighty King, are a faithful and merciful healer. Blessed are you, O Lord the healer of the sick, of his people, Israel. And then you, um, this part right here, give us our daily bread. The Amida portion says, because now he, he's asking for um, provision, being the Jewish uh, man who's praying and the Jewish rabbi leading us says, the Amida says, bless this year for us, O Lord our God. You know, we by the time you see this, it will be 2013, and um, we, we have a new year. We, we have great new expectations. Things are not going so well in the country, but in our hearts, in our own lives, things can be if we trust in Him, and if we cry out and if we pray, give us our daily bread like it was meant to be prayed. Give, 
So we say, bless this year for us, O God, together with all the varieties of his produce for our welfare. Because the God, God of, of heaven gives us so much. You go to the grocery store, food in abundance, more than the, the entire world can eat. And now we, we just, wait. sometimes we'll waste so much. If we just stick the basics, we'll be fine. Bestow, do, and rain, because rain, nothing's going to grow without do or rain. We've we seen in the droughts in the past few years here in this country. Bestow a blessing upon the face of the earth. Oh, satisfy us with your goodness, and bless your year like the best of years. Blessed are you, Lord, O oh Lord God of all creation, who blesses the years. Baruch atah Adonai Elohim. Blessed are you, Lord God, King of the universe, who blesses the years. So the Amida, the Amida portion of give us our daily bread is more involved than just one line. It is three different sections of the Amida prayer. Deliverance from, from sickness, for healing, and for provision for food and welfare. Give us our daily bread. Now, our final section for today's program before we, we run out of time is repentance. Let's go to the Lord's Prayer again. Matthew 6, verse 12. And forgive us our debts. Oh, some, some translations forgive us our sins, or some translations, I think the King James says, forgives, forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, or forgive those. Um, this is the New American Standard. It says, forgive us our debts, as we have also forgiven our debtors. So, Repentance, forgiveness, not just um, forgiving debtors or, or those. Um, remember what Jesus said here. We go back to the scripture. Um, he says 14 and 15, that kind of explains 12. Jesus says, if you forgive others their transgressions or their sins against you, people who have done you wrong, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. You remember he told the story of the, um, of the servant who owed all this money to the king, and then the king had forgiven, let's say he owed it, let's put it in modern terms, if it's, if, let's say the servant owed the king $100,000. The king said, it's forgiven, no problem. But then he, the servant was, was like a supervisor, and he had this, he had a, maybe be the guy opening the door, his servant. And this servant owed him a hundred bucks. The servant who owed him a little bit of money, the guy who was forgiven a hundred thousand, refused to forgive the other guy who owed him a hundred bucks. See how that is? And we do the same thing these days, where people sometimes refuse, refuse to forgive even the smallest things. How horrible that is. Um, Jesus is saying, if you don't forgive the man or the woman, or the person, or, or the loved one, or the child, or even the boss, who's the mean boss, who's, who's against you, who hates you because you're a Christian, or who's picking on you, or, or who, who hates you because you're not working hard enough. I mean, I mean let's, let's get real here because, I mean, all kinds of, if any kind of reason why someone don't like you or doesn't like you, um, let's say these, these people are mean for no reason. If we don't forgive them, if we don't pray them into the hands of the Lord for his handling, if we don't say, Lord, this person, I can't handle this. Some, I don't have the capacity to forgive that person for what he or she has done for me. But I want to. You have to want to forgive that person. And if you don't know how to, if you go to him, it will work out. Because I've had situations like that before and I just prayed it diligently into the hands of the Lord, and then that person, would, after a year or so, came around and started asking me to pray for her and her, her family. So, you know, God will work it out. You just go to him if you don't know how. This is what it's all about. I have a friend, um, <clears throat> a good friend. She, um, her supervisor was retiring uh, last year, and... Um, very mean person, not a Christian, 
But this my friend of mine, who was a solid uh, woman of God and, and had an evangelizing spirit, wanted to see that person saved, as we all do. We want to see the lost saved. And when we say that, we should mean it because the lost could be right standing right in front of us, the person who hates us. She prayed, and um, she realized she was supposed to buy this person a gift. She went and bought the nicest gift she can give a person who was a friend or not. And then, so she asked me for um, a tract for retirement. I couldn't find one, but she wrote out a nice long letter. I think it was a multi-page letter on the gospel and how to be saved and what it means, what a relationship with Christ means. And you know, when she gave it to that person, it had a big effect on her. She did her part. She forgave others who trespassed against her. We don't know if that person is going to be safe. But by handwriting that beautiful long letter, the gospel, what it means, and how she got saved, and how she, she hopes that the person receiving this, her mean ex-supervisor, would, well, she didn't call her mean, but, um, would respond to the gospel, to the love of Jesus, who can forgive any sin, who will forgive you if you just ask him. By doing that, she has fulfilled her part of the Lord's prayer. So let us see what the Amida says about that. Because as we said, um, the Lord's Prayer is based on the Amida. Amida section um, 4, 5, and 6. This is the um, English translation of the Jewish prayer. So some has been left out because um, most people wouldn't understand the Hebrew part of it. You favor man, O God. Barukat Adonai Elohim. Blessed are you, Lord God. You favor men with knowledge and teach mortals understanding. O oh, favor us with the knowledge and the understanding and the insight that comes from you. Blessed are you, O oh Lord, the gracious giver of knowledge. So here, the Amida, um, Jesus, using the Amida, is telling us that we are to pray for the strength to repent, to ask God to forgive us our sins as we forgive those who forgive us. It works, it works that way. It's a vertical, horizontal thing. We are, we, so we, want, we need to have the strength to repent, the will to repent, the want to repent, the desire to repent, the desire to seek forgiveness for our own sins, and then having received that, we give it to others. In, especially in the most egregious situations, because I can go on all kinds of stories about this. So we pray for understanding, and we pray for the strength and the forgiveness. And here's here the other part of the Amida relating to this, uh, this right here. Bring us back, O our Father, to your instruction. Draw us near, O our King, to your service, and cause us to, to return to you in perfect repentance. Let me read that again. Bring us back, our Father. We have strayed as a, as a church and a body of Christ in America so far from God, it, it, it's uncanny. We have attacks on religion, freedom, and all kinds of things in this country, and the church says nothing. We have abortion going out of control. We have uh, people telling people that you got to pay for abortion pills or else you're going to be fine. The church says nothing except a few. And not just that, in our own lives, have, are we, are we staying with the word? Are we praying? Are we repenting? Are we, are we seeking him with a, with a submissive heart? So he, the, the prayer of the Amida says, bring us back, O oh, Father, to your instruction, to your word, to your spirit. Draw us near, O oh, our King, to your service and cause us to return to you in perfect repentance. Amen. Blessed are you, O oh Lord, who delights in repentance. You notice at the end of every phrase, every prayer in, in the Amida, Blessed are you, Lord God, who grants this, who grants knowledge, who grants repentance, who grants forgiveness, who grants healing, who grants food, who grants our welfare, who grants the years. And finally, the, the final part of the Amida, and this is the condensed version, 
that relates to forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, the final part of the Amida, the Jewish prayer, which Jesus used to bring together here, forgive us our Father, for we have sinned. Pardon us, O our King, for we have transgressed. For you, pardon and forgive. Blessed are you, O Lord, who is merciful and always ready to forgive. And ain't that the truth? Blessed are you, Lord God, who is merciful and always ready to forgive. So, we've looked at the Lord's Prayer, four of the six portions of the Lord's Prayer and its relation to the Amida, a wonderful Jewish prayer which is still prayed in the synagogues, hoping for a Messiah who already came, but which is still relevant today because we, we will not understand the Lord's Prayer until we see it through the eyes of the Rabbi Jesus who is teaching us here. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who, for, who sin against us. Friends, thank you for joining me today. We'll finish the Lord's Prayer next time. Thank you for joining me on Plumb Line. See you again next time. God bless you.